A little bit of technical difficulties this morning. I personally think it's because we're missing our director, Ryan Harper. He's, uh, he's out and about in New Orleans today doing world domination things. But uh, I've got a great guest with us today, Mike Ambright. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. Awesome. Excited to be here. Yeah. So for y'all that didn't hear the first intro when we weren't actually on camera, uh, we're, we're going to go over uh, Mike's most profitable flip that he's done and also one that he lost money on, uh, which I really respect because uh, not many people actually want to talk about that side of the business where they've actually lost money on deals. Yeah. So before we get started in the case studies, why don't you briefly introduce yourself, tell everybody uh, who you are. Sure, sure. Uh, Mike Hambright, I am a Dallas-Fort Worth real estate investor. I've been investing for about 11 years, and we've done about 350 deals. Uh, for several years, we were doing 60 to 70 deals a year, and uh, primarily rehabbing, uh, was kind of doing it the hard way. But uh, over the last several years, I guess probably the last five or six years, we do coaching, we have a rental business, we have masterminds now. So, you know, as we've kind of gone on in our business, things get more complicated, and so we have focus uh, kind of spread thin. So about five years ago, we started a, the Flip Nerd podcast, which has evolved over the years into a membership site. We have about 1,500 different videos on real estate investing that we share, much like Propelio that we share with uh, the world for free. So lots of good stuff. How many podcast interviews have you done? So over time, we've had a couple different shows. Our main show, we're at a little bit over maybe 460, and then we have a show called REI Classroom and another one that we did for a little while that I can't even think of the name of. <laughs> Across all of those, uh, about 1,500 different shows. 1,500. So this guy is a huge advocate for education, the real estate investing world. And then also you have my favorite mastermind of all. I'm a member in it, Investor yeah. Fuel. Um, which I think is a, a great opportunity for people to come across the country, network, and, and really help each other out. So I appreciate everything that you do yeah, no doubt. for the no investing doubt. community. So let's talk about this, uh, this first deal. We're going to talk about the one where you actually made money. Okay. And then we're going to end with the one where you lost money. I need um, some Kleenexes here for the second one. <laughs> my eye on. So let's talk about this. Uh, what was the lead source on this first deal? Uh, it was a pay-per-click lead. Okay. Yeah. So when you have pay-per-click, Walk me through your system and in, in your company on, do those leads go directly to a landing page and then how do you handle it from that point on? Yeah, so we're, we're, the way that we've always been trained, the way that we teach other people how to do it and the way that we operate is we are very uh, much real time. Like we don't send anything to voicemail. We try to not send it to a call center unless it's uh, after hours or weekends, but we really kind of operate with pay-per-click the same way as the phone. So um, somebody would, you know, click on our ad, go to a website, hopefully fill out the form. And if they do, we have our system set up where it not only sends us an email, most people would assume that, but it sends a text message to our uh, dedicated, what we call the money phone, <laughs> a cell phone. And uh, what we like is that uh, when we have a ridiculous chirp on it or something, so we're like, hey, we just got an internet lead. Right. And anybody on my team, whoever's responsible for that phone, uh, knows that when you hear that chirp, pick up the phone and call it back just like the phone was ringing. We try to be real time because truthfully a lot of people with online leads, it's so easy now to do a search and then to just start filling out forms yep. until somebody responds to you. Absolutely. So we try to like literally be on the phone within seconds dialing that number back. Yeah, I think uh, I learned that from our, our buddy Trevor Mock yep. um, at Investor Carrot. He had um, either a podcast or a live video that he did and he talks about how important it is from the time a lead comes in, you really have five minutes right, to right. capture them. Yeah. And then even that's kind of being generous on our part. Sure. It really is like two or three minutes before they've left your website and now they've gone to another website and they're right. already trying to find somebody else. Yep, so no it's doubt. very important um, that you're, you're capturing right then and there. So when that person gets the lead and <clears> they, they pick up the money phone yep. and they're, they're calling them back, off the landing page, how much information are you capturing there? So we toyed with that over time. Yeah. Um, you know, we're really just trying to get their contact information. We try to have them put an address in just so we know that it's a real lead. Um, but for sure, you know, first name, email address, and uh, and because uh, we want their email address because we're following up with them in other ways. Right. And uh, we try to, we say mobile number. We want a mobile number, and it wasn't always this way, right? But we've just learned over time that people, like if they don't answer, then we text them. Right. Right, and that stuff is effective now, which 10 years ago, we didn't really think that way, but it's right. kind of how we evolved. So once you're calling them, is this more of 
information acquisition or are you actually trying to get enough information where you're making an offer over the phone? So we don't make offers over the phone. We, we okay. physically, we kind of buy at the kitchen table. Okay. You know, uh, and so what we're trying to do is just, I call it the first act of the play. We're gathering information now. My admin team is gathering information to pass on to acquisitions. And so um, their job is just to gather information. It's really one, gather information from them, and two, start building that relationship right. so that it makes everything easier, right? So we're asking them questions about the house, what made you decide to call us today, right. when are you looking to sell, things like that. So on last week's episode, you know, Jamie Woolley was on here and we talked a lot about don't buy a house, solve problems. Yeah, and, no and she was big about finding the pain point. Yep. Is that something you're trying to do absolutely. in this initial, like what absolutely. is their motivation? Yeah, absolutely. And that's evolved over time too with you know guys like John Martinez right. who have helped us up our game, just listening to him. But for sure, when people start to say, well, it doesn't really need much work, I'm just trying to you know, see how much we can get for <laughs> it, then we, we'll come back and we'll say, well, it doesn't sound like you're really that interested in selling it, are you? Maybe you just want to stay there. Right. In fact, I, I don't talk to people a lot, but I have a, a friend of a friend of a friend that had a house for sale, and she wanted me to come look at it a couple weeks ago, and I said, I said we kind of set something up, or we didn't set anything up, and then I asked her the other day, have you sold your house yet? And she said, no, I keep getting these lowball offers. And I said, it sounds like you, maybe you don't really want to sell it, because honestly, if I come make you an offer, it's not going to be higher than those other ones, probably. Right. And then she finally came back and said, you know what I really want to do is kind of fix it up and stay here. <laughs> but until you start to ask those questions or even just say that, right. people, uh, you won't know. Right. All right, so let's move on. You, you set the appointment yep. and then you're sending out an acquisitions right. manager. Or, yep. in, so we'll kind of walk us through that because I, I know you and John Martinez are, are good buddies. You know, you're both in Investor Fuel. Right. Is that, do you kind of use his tactics there on the acquisition side of things. And, and what is, are you actually going in with a set number that you're going to offer on the property before, or is that up to the acquisitions manager? It's up to the acquisitions manager. Yeah, we never know that. So kind of the first act of the play is, uh, you know, us gathering information. If we schedule an appointment, that's the goal is to schedule an appointment. So right. our admin team is pulling comps. And I know there's people that have their admins trying to figure out what the comps are. Like we've never done that. We just pull all the comps and we have our acquisitions guy figure it out in the field because okay. you know, we kind of teach like you need to physically drive past the houses to see them because right. you, on paper it's hard to see things like water towers and busy roads and in fact right. the next house we're going to talk about was on a busy road <laughs> and it had massive power lines by it and so uh, but you miss things like that on, on paper. Right. Uh, but yeah we don't know you know before we step in we know what the ARV is but we don't know what our offer is going to be until we look at the house and see the repairs. Gotcha. So yeah. in that initial appointment do they make an offer? Yes, always, 100% of the time. And are they presenting an actual physical contract or is it a verbal offer? It's a verbal offer, but we have contracts there ready to go. Okay. Yeah. Because for me, I, I think the, all these little details are very important, yeah. especially for people that have never done it before. Right. You know, because I, I remember the first couple of times I went, it was like, okay, I'm supposed to make um, an offer. Am I actually writing out a contract? And I remember the first time I went to, on an appointment, I actually wrote out a contract beforehand and I actually put a price on it, which was a huge mistake because yeah. then I get there and I'm like, this is not paint and carpet like you promised right. me on the right, phone. Right. There's way more issues here. And so I was like, well, I have a contract, but I'm going to have to go back and then I'm going to have to email it. It was just newbie mistake. Sure. And so that's no why doubt. I want to dive into these details. Yeah. So on this one particular, particularly, I know there was a story with the seller. Right. Um, there, there was quite some, quite a few issues. So why don't you go into those so people can understand? Uh, yeah. So this specific one, uh, the seller was—I don't remember his age, but he was, you know, probably late 60s. Uh, he had a son that he was still taking care. of. His wife had passed away fairly recently. This was a pretty good sized house for two people, and the other person was his son, who was older than me. He was like late 40s or something, and he had some uh, mental handicap. So, um, you know, this this guy was in a house that he just couldn't take. I mean, it was deteriorated everywhere. You could right. see it wasn't, we've seen worse, but this was in a really, really nice area of Richardson, you know, right. highly desirable area. Uh, but you could just tell he just let it go for several years, just wasn't keeping up with maintenance and things like that. And it's just, it's like, who wants to, th those aren't, those are supposed to be your golden years, right? Right. <laughs> so it's funny that, uh, you know, home ownership's not all it's cracked up right. to be. Um, but yeah, he had a lot going on and his plan was just to move into a smaller apartment. It was just easier to maintain. Gotcha. And real quick, guys, uh, for y'all that are viewing, if y'all have any questions for Mike or 
you know, any interruptions of the story here, feel free to throw them up on, on the comments here. Uh, Mike's done well over 300 plus houses in the DFW Metroplex, so we'd love to get y'all's questions out there. Um, on this one, so the wife has died, taking yep. care of middle-aged son who has a mental handicap. Right. And there's a little bit more that goes into that story because you, you know, on the notes here, you're talking about that he really just wanted the convenience of selling quickly. Yeah, yeah, when we talk to people, we always say, I mean, we say in our script when we're talking to them that we're not retail buyers. We actually use the word, we offer time and convenience for a discounted sale. Wow. And I so like we say that right up front now. That is what we offer, right? It's right. like, you, if, you ever, if you ever traded in a car, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the way to make the most money. Right. It was just easy, right, to hand over the keys and say, yeah, it's got some issues, you take it. <laughs> right. And so uh, this guy was a fairly, you know, everybody's different, but this guy was, uh, I seem to recall he was a CPA. He was a fairly savvy financially guy, you know, and he knew that he was leaving money on the table. But, you know, the truth is, is most people that we buy houses from that are distressed, and if they start to say, well, I think I'm just going to fix it up myself. And it's like, well, why haven't you done that for the last 20 years? You know, are you really going to do right. that? And, um, and so he understood it. And so he just kind of had a plan. He's like, I need to stay here for two months. We're going to get this apartment. We're going to move on. In fact, I think he even waited till uh, right after the beginning of the year because he was tax savvy. He had kind of a tax plan <laughs> as well. And, um, but what he really wanted was just the convenience and simplicity. Gotcha. Real quick, we've got a question from Matt Smith. He says, do you have a company that answers the call if you don't answer? So maybe after hours or if yeah. the lead comes in at yeah. you know, 9 p.m., yeah. how do you handle that? So we do have, uh, we've always had a backup to the backup. And if it's like, so the way it works now is admin in my office goes to that person first. If she doesn't answer after three rings, it rolls to a VA in the Philippines. And if he doesn't answer it within like two rings, then it rolls to a call center. So I'm always apprehensive to even say who the call center is because it's not good. It's <laughs> right. not good. And we know lots of them. And truthfully, the one I use is one that not many people have heard of. And I just say, like, I don't even want to tell you because it's just not that good. Right. But I know a lot of people use Pat Live. But it's call better some than other better than going to voicemail. Voicemail yeah. and nothing. Because right. like what we talked about, right? it's just they're going to go find someone else. No doubt. And there's going to be somebody That's why we there. do it because a warm voice is better. But we, you know, we've seen issues where they are in a call queue, like waiting to be answered from the call center, which defeats the purpose. But right. we, do, uh, we do send them to a call center just as like backup to the backup. So my buddy, Quentin Flores, which I just told you before, yeah. you need to get him on the Flip Nerd podcast. Yeah. So Quentin, if you're watching, you need to hook up with Mike and get on his podcast. <laughs> but um, just last week, I saw Quentin post on Facebook. It was probably 11.30 on a Friday night. Yep. He's like, just got a call and just got a property under contract That's awesome. right then. But think about it. Had he not answered that phone, no doubt. there's going to be someone in a major city that's going to answer the phone. Right. And so once you get to a certain point, and like you said, when you first got started, you were that guy. 24-7, right? yeah. We, had, we actually started out of the gate with an admin because we were, I mean, we bought 65 houses in our first year with no experience. So we right. were kind of... You know, we corporate refugees, like we knew we couldn't dabble, like we had to ramp this thing up, you know. And um, so we couldn't ask them to take the phone home because they're just our, you know, they're really admins, they're right. 40 hour a week type folks. And uh, so whenever they didn't have it, if it was time for them to go, they would hand the money phone to me and I'm on call basically 24 seven. So there's no doubt, like in the bathroom, right. just sat down for dinner with the family, at church, like whatever, I got to answer this call right. for a few years. And then it gets to a point to where you're like, I got to find another solution because lifestyle wise, this isn't how I want to live. Right. You know? So just depending on where you are in your business and in your career, if you're just getting yep. started, you're probably you going you to have to do that for a while. And right. then you systematize your business. And then like now where Mike's at, I mean, you have three different options. Right. And, and you're not one of those options at no, all. No, I haven't answered the phone in years. Yeah. So there you go. So back to the deal. Um, gentleman, wife's died, taking care of the son, wants the convenience. You make a cash offer, correct? Yep. That's right. Um, and, and you get this property under contract for 160000 That's right. Okay. So at this point in time, I think everybody always wants to know, because they hear about these great deals and okay, this is gonna be one of your most profitable deals. You get it under contract for 160,000. How are you gonna finance this deal? 
So on this specific one, we used a local community bank that I had built a relationship with over the years. Okay. Yeah. So how long did it take you to build that relationship to where you could it buy a distressed while. property? It took a while. I mean, so I started in 2008 and l lenders really just stopped lending. Right. Right. But uh, we got our foot in the door with a local bank that, you know, wasn't doing a lot of real estate stuff. And um, we had a family member that knew somebody there. And so we kind of got our foot in the door. And uh, what we did was, uh, and I'll just kind of share how we got that relationship if you want, because I actually was talking to somebody about this last week, is we built up a little bound book of like our last 20 deals or something like that. Nice. And we basically said what we bought it for, here's before and after pictures, what we sold it for. And um, like they're just amazed. First off, it tells a story, right? It's right. easy for me to say, well, we flip houses and make money, but to like visually see it, even bankers, like their, their first question always is, how did you buy it for that? Because they just don't understand <laughs> yeah, buying distressed properties. But physically showing them like a book, here's pictures, what we bought it for, what we sold it for, what our profit was. Yep. Um, and we could literally say, these are our last 20 deals and there's no losses, you know, then that just kind of sealed the deal. We're well, like, we would like to work with you. You know, we had Jason McDougall on here yeah. in the second episode and you know, you're good friends with Jason. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Jason McDougall has actually talked about going into a bank talking to the banker about his business and then eventually that banker becoming a private money lender yeah. in his business because right. well, just what you said right how do you find these deals at this discount and to them they don't know because they're not in this business right to everybody else it's just like that's for us you know it's normal it's what we do but uh it so it's important to always be getting out what you do and explaining the numbers so on this you built out an actual, like, almost portfolio right. of your this, work. These are the deals we've done. You know, how, were, how were many you days taking we that to multiple for? banks? No, we took it to a couple, and um, and so we took it to a couple. And and you know, it's kind of it's this weird situation with private money or bank money. Is it's it's first off, it's hard to raise money when you're first getting started. Right. And then you easily get to a point to where like you could raise way more money than you could use. So there's this balancing act. Like you don't want to raise money from a bunch of people and say, oh, I'll give you a million dollars. And you're like, hey, awesome. Can I just have 60,000 right now? <laughs> right. And put the rest in an account and don't touch it and I'll just let you know when I need it. Like right. nobody wants to do that. They want to keep their money active. Right. And so we've talked to people before early on and they like what we're doing. They're like, well, how would $2 million work? And we're like, well, I don't need that much. You know, and right. so anyway, it's, it's first world problems, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of people that are watching right now <laughs> right. that are like, yeah, you could just, you yeah, know, funnel stuff. Ship that is the here. thing to do, honestly. I'm not a lender, but that is really what a lot of guys do. They get good at raising money. They're like, well, I'm going to flip my own houses with it and I'm going to lend it to. And, you know, obviously your lenders, your right. ultimate lenders need to be okay with that. Right. But, um, yeah, that is one way to kind of use your excess cash. So you establish the relationship with the, the local bank. Yeah. By basically giving them a portfolio of previous jobs that you had done. That's right. What do the terms look like with a bank like that? So uh, they were pretty similar to what they are now. So we're paying 6% um, and uh, we have to put 20% down. 20% of the purchase price or 20% of 20% of the repairs as well. Yeah. So they're giving you 80% of the purchase, 80% of the rehab, and then 6% interest, which is essentially like half of what a typical hard money lender. Right. Which is what majority of no doubt. First first time flippers are going to go out and get if you don't have private money. Right. And so the trade off is you have to have some of your own money to put in. Right. And yeah. so were you using your own money or were you using private money for we the We were cash? using our own money for the rest. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes we were using private I'm, I'm sorry, sometimes we use our private lender to to basically be the second yeah. mortgage piece, yeah. Yeah. So on this seems like the repairs were pretty significant. It looks like you're yeah. slightly south of $100,000 in repairs. Right. What did the property look like as far as what you need to actually do to it. So we, we rehabbed a lot of houses, probably a couple hundred houses. And this is uh, probably to date one of the bigger rehabs that we've done. But what happened was we bought the house and uh, we used a couple of comps that turned out were also a little bit distressed. They weren't really all the way done. So, and the way we found that out is right before we closed on the house, um, or right, right, maybe it was right after we closed on the house, the house across the street went on the market. Nice. And it was like way more. It was actually smaller than ours too, but way more than what we thought it should be. And we started digging into the comps and we found out that, hey, we use some distressed comps, so our value actually is higher. So to the tune of, you know, it was about uh, 
$60,000 higher than what we thought, which is obviously, that doesn't happen a lot, but that's nice when that happens. Right. Yeah. So real quick, funny story. Uh, looks like Luis Mendez got blocked by sharing our video so many times. We must be bringing such amazing content that <laughs> Facebook has now officially blocked us. So Luis, I apologize that you've been blocked off Facebook, buddy, but I appreciate the support. Um, also, uh, here in a, a couple of seconds, I think we're going to do a giveaway today. Uh, are we going to do another Beat Kids Cancer hat, or, or do we want to do a book? Let's do a book. No beard, no beard oil this time. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I got to keep some for myself. So, uh, but I, I do want to do a giveaway. Um, let's actually do a book. I want to do the uh, if you can't wholesale after this, I've got nothing for you. The Todd Fleming book. Uh, I think it's one of the best books out there for for wholesaling. So let's do that here in a second and. Uh, Getting back to this, um, so you've you've closed on it. It's got pretty significant damages here, hundred thousand dollars. Are you hiring a GC or you know you're doing quite a few yeah. rehabs? Do you actually have your own crews that you're subbing this so out? So we to? have a GC that's here. He's rehabbed a couple hundred houses for me. Uh, we've become great friends. You know you know who he is. Yeah. I'm not going to say his name because I don't want anybody else to use him. <laughs> um, he's probably might even be watching right now. So right. anyway, uh, yeah, I, I use a contractor to get that done. Now the interesting thing about this house is it was a pretty large house two-story and most of the work was cosmetic like it wasn't there was no found there were no foundation issues I don't think we replaced the roof it had like a big patio with a pool that we did a fair bit of work on and so you know some of those things just add up fast right. when you're talking about big privacy fences and other things what happened on this one though is when we realized the market value was quite a bit higher had the potential to be um, we decided to just basically double down and make the house even nicer. So we go. spent it close to, we spent about 96.5, but I think our original budget was 60. Okay. And then when we saw, hey, it's worth more, like let's put another 30 into it and we'll get another extra 30 out of it. Gotcha. Yeah. So when you do something like that, for some people, they don't have that cash. Right. To do that, is that something that you were using your own cash or? We were using a private lender. So on yeah, that, you go to a private lender right. and you say, hey, I need an additional 30,000. Right. And this is the reason why. Yep. What, at what point in time does it become worth spending the additional 30,000? Like how much more profit do you have to make to spend that additional 30,000? Yeah, that's, that's always the decision you have to make, right? right. I mean, the rehab is gonna take longer or holding periods longer. Right. And uh, you know, but we're, what happens is early in your business, you know, we wholesaled a lot more, we assigned a lot more to get the cash coming in. And then it got to a point to where, you know, we're rehabbing five, six, seven houses at any time. And uh, the business was doing well. So we could afford to make those decisions. Like you, your horizon, if your business starts doing well, sometimes you can extend it and say, well, I'll, you know, I'll put an extra 30 in to get 60 out of it. It's gonna take me two more months, but 30 grand for two months is, you know, I right. can do that. Now, sometimes, you know, for all we know, this is a this house is in a really hot area. We didn't even try to wholesale it. We could have done really well, probably wholesaling it. Right. After we knew the real values and everything, but. Gotcha. Yeah. So okay, you bought it for 160. Let's just call it for simplicity's sake. You put 100 into it. Yep. So you're 260 all in. What did you list the property for? Uh, we listed it for a little bit north of 400, and we sold it for 400. And did it go quickly? Was it yeah. one of those? I mean, Richardson. Yeah. For, the, for the, those that are not familiar with DFW, uh, Richardson is one, has been one of the hottest markets here in, in DFW yeah. in quite some time. So I'm, assur I'm assuming that one went pretty quickly. So the net yeah. profit on this was 110,000. That's right. And just off the top of your head, how long from start to finish do you think that took? So it was about a little over six months. A little bit over six months and 110,000. Yeah. And the reason on this specific one is uh, that we, it, it was, you know, it was an older house, like early 70s build, and it had this really weird staircase that we kind of redid. I don't really, I don't like to move a lot of walls and do things like that, right. but we, we did. It was like a $400,000 house and you got a duck when you come down the stairs. It was a little weird. So we kept rejiggering that and the city really gave us a hard time with permits. Like they told us how to do it and then we did it and they're like, well, that doesn't pass code. And we're like, well, we did exactly what you told. And <laughs> right. so we went round and round and round with permits. And truthfully, I needed a real carpenter, like literally a staircase expert to build this wow. versus my general general contractor. My, uh, and so that, that added a little bit of time. <laughs> so just for people's understanding, because at this point in time, your business was established. Yeah, that's right. You weren't a part of the lead gen you weren't a part of the acquisitions of the property. That's right. How much part of the, the rehab were you involved in? 
So, uh, you know, I check on rehabs. I, I don't do anything. Like, right. you know, I don't know how to do anything. You, you, wanna, <laughs> you see, uh, Cassie knows I've got soft hands here. Like, you know, these hands don't uh, touch tools. <laughs> so, so really, for the most part, you systematize your business to be pretty hands off on this rehab. Yeah. And your, your sure. company was able to net 110,000. Yep. Yeah. So that's a pretty cool case study right there. Yeah, I didn't share it here, and I'm just real fast. Like my second most profitable deal of all time, which was uh, just a slightly less than this. I've mm -hmm. only done two deals over six figures, which in DFW is hard, right? There's right. not a lot of, but uh, was a wholesale deal, and we net almost as much as that. And I did a clean out for two hundred dollars, put it on the MLS, and made almost as much. So just straight wholesale. Yeah. Closed on it, put it on the MLS, and almost yeah. uh, made six figures. Yeah. On yeah. It. yeah. Uh, and I, they were around the same time. And see, that's like, I clearly would have rather done more of those but, right you know you can't pick your deals so that's a that's a cool story yeah. but we can't take up 20 minutes of uh facebook live time <laughs> with that story <laughs> there's not much to it well yeah. body i put it on the mls and it's well i just over. want to tell people that are whole, only yeah. wholesaling like hey you could make some good money wholesaling as well absolutely so we're going to come back after these commercials we're going to dive into case study too and uh, it looks like uh, the the man himself daniel moore is actually watching so daniel thank you for uh tuning in to your uh, your own show here <laughs> but uh we'll be right back after these commercials All right, guys. Thanks for uh, joining us today, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed case study number one. Uh, Mike's just got tons of uh, knowledge in the real estate investing world. He's, he's one of my good buddies and, and mentors. I, I really look up to him. So please drop some uh, questions and comments. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to, to get as much out of Mike. You know, he's here to, to help everybody out. So drop some questions in there. It doesn't have to be particular to the, the case study. It can be really anything in real estate investing that you want to ask. And uh, I know that we want to give away Todd Fleming's If You Can't Wholesale After This, I've Got Nothing For You book. Uh, do we have the capability today to do the random drawing? No. We do not have the capability. So I'm <laughs> going to have to come up with a trivia question here. So uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Mike some questions while I come up with the trivia question. <laughs> so now we're, we're going to talk about a, a deal that you actually took a loss on. Yep. And uh, I said it at the beginning, I love that you're bringing something that actually brings like the, the reality of real estate investing. You can lose money. Sure. You know, I, I mean, know. there's a lot that can happen. And uh, so I want to go into this. The, the lead source on this was direct mail. That's right. So direct mail. The, the calls are coming in to you, correct? So to my admin team, yeah. Right, to your admin team. So right. are you handling it the same way as the pay-per-click? Exactly the same way, yeah. We kind of treat them all the same. You know, there's, it's a matter of whether we call them or they call us. Right. But of course, we're handling the same script and everything. There you go. Yep. Okay, so on this one, this one comes in. Walk me through the pain point and how you negotiated this because the loss actually started at the beginning of the negotiations. Oh, no doubt. No so, doubt. So yeah. let's go into that. It was that. all based on the way that we bought it. Um, you know, we've probably lost out on a lot of deals over the last 11 years because we're, we're pretty conservative in our nature, but we've lost money on a handful. And uh, it's funny that you never forget those, right? You know, right. <laughs> those are the biggest lessons. Um, but yeah, so we were talking to this guy. He, was, he had lived in the house previously and moved somewhere else, and he had turned it into a rental. Um, and the tenant moved out, and he was just ready to be done with it. Okay. Yep. So he's ready to be done with it. And does he have a particular number in mind that he wants to get for the house? He did. Yeah. And it was, that was definitely above what we offered right. the first time. And we kind of, he kind of negotiated us up. So see, yeah. I think sometimes as real estate investors, that's a huge mistake that we make Yeah. is that we actually care what they want for the house. That's right. Like really, we shouldn't be concerned about that at all. Um, I saw someone posted on Facebook the other day, I think it was Elizabeth Navarrete, that said um, what the seller wants for the house and what is owed on the mortgage is irrelevant to us as real estate investors. I agree with that, yep. Because what, ended, what ends up happening on this deal is that somehow what he wanted for the house in the end ends up hurting you. 
Sure. You know? Yeah, you never know. I mean, you, you always have the option to walk away. And right. truthfully, we walk away from most deals, right? Um, but uh, I think we, you know, we had some other big misses on this one that we just didn't, uh, we didn't see or we overlooked. Sometimes, sometimes you fall in love with a deal or it's like a slow month and you're like, we need to get at least one in the bag or whatever it might right. be. You start to find ways in your head to justify deals. Sometimes. Or like in this circumstance, the seller gets creative yeah. and offers financing to you. Right. Which we've done that only a few times, literally have hundreds of deals because we've had bank lines and private lenders and right. things. But he said, well, what if, I, what if I fund it for you? I will tell you generally, it's hard to buy from other uh, financially savvy people. Right. He was an investor, he, was, he had owned some other real estate and he, you know, he was fairly savvy. Um, and uh, so- well, clearly this is a rental property and he just wants to get rid of it. Right. Which right there is kind of a red flag. Because yeah. it's like real estate investor, he's been, He's owned this property, he's been cash flowing, and now he wants to get rid of it and he wants to pass the problem on to me. Right, it's kind of yeah. a red flag. I mean, it could be a good deal. Right, right. So now he offers you seller financing. Yeah, so we just kind of justified in our mind, like, well, if he's gonna, if he's gonna fund it, you know, I don't remember what the rate was we paid him. Probably, it wasn't less than 6%, so we might have even paid him like eight, but we're like, hey, we don't have to, we don't have to pull out of our normal line. That's not right. gonna slow us down. So it's kind of, it's an incremental deal. Sometimes you fall in love with right. an investor and you're like, well, it's less profitable, but you know, it's, it's incremental profit. Right. And you start to justify stuff in your head, right? <laughs> so once he- I say right, like you've done it too, but you know what I mean, you can see. Absolutely, no, yeah. and, and I've, I've definitely made these same mistakes where right. for whatever reason, it's almost like you create the deal in your head. Like, this is why it could be a good deal for my company right today. Whereas right. if it was an individual deal all by itself and you were consulting someone else and you didn't have any emotions involved in it, you would just tell them, walk away from it. I do that all the time with people. I do too. Uh, my, my, one of my best buddies in the world, she was on here last week, Jamie Woolley. She'll call me about a deal and she'll be like, RJ, I've got this deal. What should I do? I have no problem making a decision like that and telling her exactly what she should do. But then all of a sudden when it becomes a titanium deal, and you know we've worked hard for the lead, and I've got employees who have commissions exactly, on the line. Exactly. All of a sudden, I started getting concerned about all of these other outside influences besides, is this the best deal for Titanium to do? Right. So he offers you the seller financing, and that did that that skewed the numbers for you? We kind of decided, well, we were willing to to take that on since he was offering a sweetener, which really wasn't much of a sweetener, but right. you know, you'll see, we'll talk about it here in a second, but truthfully, we just overlooked some big things that are really kind of newbie mistakes. Um, and uh, we fell in love with the deal a little bit too much. In fact, it was a cool house. It was like, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen a house, we've never bought a house for our business and just moved into it, like, cause we thought it, we loved it. Right. But there have been a couple that were like contenders and this was maybe one of them which part of probably part of the problem. So yeah, that's, de that's definitely one of the problems. There was emotions involved, you know, yeah. you, you liked the house. Um, so you, you talked about some things that you overlooked on the rehab side of things. Is that, does that fall on acquisitions? Do you have a due diligence period where you're sending a contractor? Or how did those things, like I'm assuming after this happened, you implemented some things in your business to make sure that doesn't get overlooked. So how do you avoid that mistake now? Yeah, this was so. This was one where I. Um, this was a little bit more a, a bigger of a property and a project than what we were taking on at the time. We were doing lots of smaller rehabs, and so I, um, you know, I'm responsible for this. There was a time in my business, and this was this one's a, a couple years back, where I would go look at every deal, and truthfully, because of the market, I've gotten a little sloppy. Like now, I just oh, send me some pictures. I I look at the comps and I make decisions now. There, if there was ever a time to not get sloppy, it's starting to happen now, right? So it kind of advise people like button things up a little bit more now because the market is starting to slow down. Gotcha. But uh, no, I'll take full responsibility for this deal. Okay. Yeah. So there was mistakes made on the rehab. You closed on the property. At what point in time do you realize, uh-oh, we're, we're, yeah. we're in deep. Pretty we, much we right away when we started rehabbing <laughs> it. So, you know, we were still hopeful on the ARV, but the repairs went up a lot too. So what happened was there really, there's one that I didn't put on here that I just thought of uh, as we we're talking. So there were really three main things that brought us down uh, from the repair side. The first one is when the guy met us there, it had, it had one of those big circle, this is in North Dallas, had Richardson ISD, had one of those big circle drives, right? 
and uh, he parked on the top of this massive crack. Now, I'm not saying that he hit it, but we just didn't see. Like, that's, that's the neighborhood and the type of house that you don't leave that, if you right. don't rehab a house and leave that. So we had to break out this huge circle drive and replace that driveway. Wow. And I mean, it was probably like a six or $8,000 driveway. Right. You know, that we weren't even expecting to do anything on, but it was like right at the front door. It was just like, this is gonna be a problem. <laughs> yeah. So for, for those of you that are just joining us, you know, we've already talked about Mike's biggest, profit, most profitable flip that he's ever done. Right now we're going through the deal that he's taking a loss on. And, uh, you know, I wanna give away Todd Fleming's book. So for the trivia question, uh, I'm gonna join in the misery and bring up my biggest loss. Yeah. So for the people that can name the city in which Titanium Investments took its biggest loss, We'll give away Todd Fleming's If You Can't Wholesale After This, I Got Nothing For You book. Um, and the reason why is because I should have just wholesaled the house. It was not a bad house. I was just the wrong investor for the house. <laughs> so uh, we tried to you know, virtually flip a house in a market that we were not prepared to virtually flip in. Right. That's why we took the loss. So, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, we're, as we're talking about these losses that we, we took here, um, these are, lessons that we learned and they helped us grow. No doubt. We, we've already got a winner on here. Man, I, Chris Strong, Chris Strong he, he busted that out. He's like San Antonio. So ours was San Antonio, Texas. And uh, uh, on ours, regretfully, there wasn't like one or two things that we, that popped up. We literally did everything on the house three to four times. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm talking about foundation. I mean, all new piers, all new beams, rewired the house, replumbed the house, literally everything, multiple times. Wow. It was the most miserable experience <laughs> of my life. So on this, on your, on your deal, um, you find out about the circle drive, you gotta replace that. Right. Were there any other things that kind of were cost prohibitive to the deal? So the second thing that hurt us on the repairs uh, was, it was on a fairly, it was like off of a fairly busy road, but it was the house on the corner. So okay. we kind of justified it. Well, it's not really on a busy road. The entrance was off of the main road, but it was still a fairly busy road. Like right. you would much rather, if you were looking at a house, be five houses in than right there. Right. And so we just overlooked it. Now, not only was it a, a fairly busy road, on the other side of it, there was this massive like power highway. And I'm not talking about like power, you're talking about the big metal like power highway, you know, that, <laughs> that they try to like, pretend isn't there by putting a walking path under it. Right. So we're like, oh, well, there's a walking path. It's like the green belt. We're like, well, yeah, but after we bought the house and we're sitting there in the yard, like thinking about stuff and you could hear a buzz like from, <laughs> the, from the power line, like that's not a good thing. Yeah, You're no. like, man, I, I, I think I'm gonna get cancer just sitting here. Right. right. So uh, that was the second big miss. We just, you know, sometimes you just basically say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Right. You know, all it takes is one person to, to, to not care. It's amazing how those things don't feel like big deals when you're there to acquire the property. Yeah, no doubt. And then suddenly, once you get close to being done with the rehab and you're going to list, you're like, wow, that is a very loud street. And <laughs> what is that buzzing in the backyard? You know, it's yeah. like suddenly you start realizing all of these issues that you overlooked at the beginning. So when you went to, you know, you completed the rehab and you're, you're going to list the property, did you take into account the power lines and the busy road, did you lower from your original ARV or were, did you go We in? definitely sold it for less than what we thought the ARV was. And I can't remember exactly. I know we had to keep lowering the price a few times to get it down to right. basically uh, get some people to come in and look at it. Well, let's talk about this because I don't think we've, we've talked about this yet on Titanium Tuesdays. When you go to list a property, do you have a specific agent that you're working with, a realtor, or is that something that you is that something you have built into your team or how are you listing these properties? So that's changed over time too. When we first started uh, 11 years ago, shortly thereafter my wife Lindsay got her license for the purpose of listing our houses just because we had dealt with a few realtors and didn't have the best experience. So right. we're like, we just need to do this ourselves. And so, um, you know, we, we would still have admins on our team do a lot of the work, uh, but it was listed under Lindsay's license. Gotcha. And then about, maybe about three or four years ago, in the process of Lindsay and I talking about our business. How can we live a better life? How can we make things easier? 
the thing at the top of her list was, I don't ever want to have to list a house again. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is going to make my marriage better, right? So um, I ended up going with a flat fee agent here that has raised his price a few times, but it's, I still use the same guy today. In fact, we're listing a house today with him. Gotcha. Yeah. And have you found that to be as effective as when Lindsay was listing them or another agent? The yeah, flat no did. problems. I mean, I know agents are going to scoff at this. I Honestly, when you're selling houses, if you have them priced right and or they're rehabbed right, like you're competitive, you know, I feel like 90% of the battle is just getting on the MLS for buyer's agents to find right. it. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure there'll be a tons of agents that uh, disagree with that, but yeah. I, I have to agree with that to a certain extent. I also think it's important in which price point you're listing properties. No, I agree with that. I, you know, if you were to go list- if you're doing some it, really high end right. things, that would be different, but we don't do that really. And also specific neighborhoods, yeah. you know, um, so I, I, but pricing and the, the quality of work is gonna be what actually sells the right. property. That's what attracts a buyer. Right, so you've listed the property now, finally get an offer, you've had multiple price reductions, yep. and then you have more problems, right? Yeah, so we knew at that point when we got an offer that we agreed to, we already knew we were gonna lose money. You know, and it's one of those things that uh, in the real estate business, if you know you're gonna lose money, like just try to lose it as fast as possible and get right. move on. And you can't, you know, there's people that are like, well, I'm just gonna move into it or start trying to, maybe I should add on to it or you d just don't double down on a loss. Right. Like just get it out of the way. So we had already come to terms with that. Uh, but what happened is in the process of selling it, they had inspections done. They came back with a inspection report and uh, we had just never gone in the attic. And it turns out that the uh, the roof had a had a cedar shingles. It had asphalt shingles on top of cedar shingles, which as you know is a big no-no here. Right. I mean, you just can't get insurance. Now, by the way, you could have multi-million dollar houses with cedar shingles in the mountains where there actually are fires and it's <laughs> apparently not a problem, but in Texas, cedar shingles are a problem. <laughs> and so, you know, it didn't have decking because they put cedar yep. shingles, they don't have decking. And so we had to not only strip two layers of shingles, we had to redeck it and put a roof on. It was about yep. a $14,000 roof. So that was an additional $14,000 yeah. loss that we didn't know was coming. Yeah, that's like, uh that's a double whammy there because like you said, if you've never actually had to replace this kind of roof, this is not you're, you're tearing the shingles off and putting new shingles down. It's you're tearing two roofs off and then there's nothing there. You have to put all the no decking plywood, down. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to redeck it and then put the new shingles down. And so that is, uh, that is a, a <laughs> terrible, like that's a, that's a bad inspection report yeah. right there. And honestly, we've had two issues like that before where we didn't look in the attic and something was, you know, we had, we've had two cedar shingle overlay problems. And after the second time, it's like, this isn't gonna happen again. Right. We're gonna look every time. Right, and that basically doubled your loss yep. on this deal. Yep. So on this one, you, you bought at 190,000. He seller financed it to you. So this whole time yeah. you're taking a loss, yeah. you're also paying the guy that sold you the house. <laughs> that's right. So it's like, it's like salt can't blame him. I can't blame him, no. but what, what I will tell people is like, this guy got paid no questions asked. Like we had to pay for that. And so right. when you're using private lenders, whether it's a one-off deal like this or banks or anybody else, um, you know, you, your lender should never get hurt. Right. If they do, they will never work with you again. Absolutely. Right. So on this one, you- He didn't you, even know, he probably didn't even know we lost money. It's not like we went to tell him about it. We just no. cut him a check at closing and we were done. Yeah, it's, not, it's really none of his business. His, his job's yeah. done at that yeah. point in time. Put about 69,000 in it in rehab after he bought for 190 and he sold it for 259. Right. So a net loss of right around $28,500. Let's round down, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to include the $69 as well. <laughs> so he, he's very specific on here. On the, on the one where you made money, yeah. you just wrote one, 110K. On the net loss, you wrote $28,569. I'm surprised you don't have like the pennies on there too. <laughs> we know it, yeah, so, it's a QuickBooks, so. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Daniel Moore has a, a great point. He says, uh, you know, rip off the Band-Aid. When, yeah, when you're no losing doubt. a deal, you just gotta end it. No know? doubt. And uh, so I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I know yeah. that it could be it could be frustrating. I could but have shared any deals. We could have shared, hey, this is all the good side, but right. I think it's it's important to for guys like us and on Propelio to admit that things are not always the land of milk and honey. Like Absolutely. there are challenges, but we would not be doing this if it wasn't generally a great business. Absolutely. All right, guys, we're going to go to commercial real quick, and then we're going to come back for Q&A with Mike. Uh, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, please drop some questions on there. Mike's got tons of knowledge, and uh, this is your opportunity to ask him anything you want.
So we'll be right back over these messages. Right, guys hope you are enjoying today's episode thank you for tuning in um, I know we've got a great question uh, Luis Mendez actually asked it a couple of seconds ago um, he said if you were to get started today how would you start so I'm assuming he's talking about what strategy would you start with right and uh, what would you do differently than what you did when you first got started? Yeah, that's a good question. We teach a lot of people how to get started, how to build a business. I mean, what, what I teach fundamentally is what I wish I had done differently, right? And so that is, and we did, we treated it like a business, but you know, I, I think when I first started, this is gonna sound funny now that we have investor fuel and all these things, but I, I didn't really want to network. Like I kind of right. wanted to just put my head down and do my own thing. Now we were at a time then where we were, you know, we weren't like homeless. I know some guys that lived in cars and then they started crushing it eventually because right. they had hit bottom. But for us, we had left our jobs. We were in a difficult position. Where we were just burning through cash and we, it was like a time bomb for us to figure it out. So we just put our heads down and worked really hard. Um, and so what I wish I had done earlier though is work with other wholesalers, network, surround myself with more mentors, things like that because honestly, when I started to do that, my business really took off. And I right. started to enjoy it more too. I'm, I'm a social creature, you know, so right. I like to be around other people that are like-minded. But for a while there, I kind of put the blinders on and I just thought, hey, everybody's my competition, so let me just do my own thing here. Well, I think you and I talked about this before on um, either, either one of our podcasts. And we were talking about because we were successful in a, a corporate career and then we became an entrepreneur, it was almost like because we we didn't want to network because we didn't feel like we had all the answers. Right. So it was like we stayed in our own little box. Yep. And instead of getting out there and networking and finding the answers much faster. No doubt. You know, and no doubt. And looking back at it, I think both you and I, those are regrets that we have, um, where it's like we could have, you know, scaled up much faster had we not. Yeah. gotten in our own head and in our yeah, own Yeah, and way. even the first few years, like I, we were, my wife and I were, we had an admin and we brought in an acquisitions person relatively fast, but we were doing everything ourselves. We mm -hmm. were just working ourselves to the bones and we still work really hard now, but like then it was out of necessity because we didn't put the right people in place. Now it's just out of, I'm a workaholic, so that's what I do. Right. But, um, you know, I think getting a team in place faster, because as you know, this business gets a lot better when you can scale it. If you're living month to month and buying one house, like you're not gonna be able to afford a team, you can't grow your business, and all you're doing is just getting from day to day. But when you start to step up to two or three houses a month, now you can afford to invest back in your business, and it truly becomes a business instead of a hobby, right? Right, so I know one of the questions that we had was, how have you been able to build such a great team? I know I've personally asked you, because I've, I've gotten to meet your team, Yeah, I love your team, I've yep. literally told you I'm going to steal parts of your team, yep. and you told me you would kill me if I did it. I'm going to take Cassie. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, kind of talk about that, because I think building a team is so important. There's so many people out there that right now are, are starting to taste that success. And like you're talking about now, all of a sudden you're doing three, four, five deals a month, and it's becoming overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, financially maybe it's good, but personally, you know, your life – is taking a hit because you're so overwhelmed with the work. Right. So how do you start building a team? It's hard. I mean, the best thing I can do is kind of share like my, the way that I matured in my business and I'm not like there yet. Like I'm always trying to find ways to take it to another level. But I think early on, I, um, you know, I just, I would hire people and in my mind, I didn't say this explicitly, but I treated them like they were just a commodity. Mm -hmm. Like just do the job I hired you for. Like, let's stop talking about it and do it. Right. You know, or I would always try to find somebody that was like the cheapest or, you know, I kind of made a lot of those mistakes early on. And then when I realized uh, as I kind of grew that, like, I want people to have ownership. I want them to be proud of what they're doing. Uh, I think that really changed everything. When I, it's not like I didn't care about people, but I didn't act like I cared. Even right. if I did my mind, I'm like, oh, I really want the best for that person. But I think I'm just more explicit now in how to get them to grow 
uh, inside of my company too. And truthfully, I'm also not really concerned if they want to leave at some point. Now, I don't want anybody to leave, but I'd be a fool to think that they're never going to leave or they don't ever want to. Right. And so I think just asking questions like, what do you, where do you want to be in two or three years? Like, let's figure out if we can make that work with us. But if they want to move on, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be able to keep them there. Gotcha. So we've got a question here. Um, when you hired your, ad, your first admin person, <laughs> how did you know <laughs> what tasks to delegate to them? Yeah, that's a good question. Because um, right now you're doing everything yourself, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. like, well, what do I want to take off my plate and what do I trust this person to right, do? Right, right. Yeah, the big thing, I mean, for, in this business, it's, it's, the roles are pretty clear. I mean, not 100%, but like 80%, pretty clear. An admin role, I need them to take the calls. I need them to be a transaction coordinator, uh, help keep us organized. You know, all those, those are kind of the primary roles of, a, of an initial admin. Um, but it's evolved a lot from us just like telling you what to do to now we, we use, you know, we've shown you guys this before, we use Asana. We have like, when you buy a house, we have 77 things you have to do. Right. Here's exactly how to do them. And it's effectively just a checklist of exactly what to do in that business. So at the first, at the first time, you know, we've had a lot of admins and uh, we, our show's not long enough to go over. <laughs> There's definitely some, uh, some uh, stories in right. there. But, so yeah. real quick though, I, I wanna, cause he briefly glanced by a golden nugget there. Asana is an app that he uses, that he has a checklist of 77 different things that need to be done when buying a house. Yep. And so your whole team knows this is the checklist, this needs to be done. Yep. On those actual tasks, are they delegated to a specific person? They're all delegated to specific people. So everybody knows, there's no question, we got a property under contract, boom. These are, out of the 77, these are the 20 things that I have to do. That's exactly right. So that's one of the ways that you've basically systematized that one activity in your company. Right. And have you done that throughout all of the different We do that days. for everything. When, when, we're, when we have a, a podcast, we have a, a template for that. There's, you know, I don't remember how many tasks it is, probably 50 right. different tasks from book it in the calendar, to ask the person for a headshot, all the way to publish it on this date. And I will yeah. say, <laughs> as being a guest on your podcast. Twice. <laughs> twice, <laughs> yes, twice. Not only, on purpose. Only one was ever broadcasted. One was, only one was recorded. <laughs> yes, uh, but as being a guest, I mean, your setup and the lead up to being a guest on your show was unbelievable. I was yep. blown away by the professional emails, the infographics that were sent, the follow-up questions. I mean, the systems that you have set up, I can only imagine what it's like to actually like sell a house to you because <laughs> as like a motivated seller, how comfortable I would be because as a guest, I was like, I, as a fellow po podcast host, I literally brought my uh, assistant in and I said, these are the seven emails I've received <laughs> to be a guest on the Flip Nerd podcast. I need us to create something similar to this <laughs> because I was blown away by it. Yeah. And so I, over the course of time, how long do you think it, uh, it has taken you to create the checklist just on the real estate investing side of things? I mean, it evolves still, like t you know, 10 years. Um, so it started with just, we have a bunch of stuff on a whiteboard, are the utilities on, like all these things. Big whiteboard in the back of our office to uh, moving it into Excel, to having like a printed out Excel checklist and then moving into more apps that can really help you manage that from anywhere. So here we go. You have to answer this completely honestly. Okay. You're grinning, so I don't know what to expect there. <laughs> are, are, you willing, are you willing to share the Asana checklist? Uh, who asked? <laughs> Matt, <laughs> who asked? <laughs> uh, yeah, someone from Titanium Investments. No, uh, it was uh, Matt Smith. Okay, so I will share it for our deals. Now, you can't share a project in Asana, so I can export it to Excel. Okay. And then share. Now, actually, you can take Excel, you can copy and paste it into Asana, and it actually pastes perfectly into there a template. There you go. Cool. Yeah. The name of the app is Asana. It's A S A N A. Yeah. We use it literally. Honey do list at home. <laughs> when, when we have investor fuel, you know, we have a template for every right. single thing. We, everything we do is in there. These are our standard, it's really our standard operating procedures for how we do anything ultimately goes in there. That's awesome. Yeah. Let's get some more questions on here, guys. We've got a couple more minutes with Mike. Um, I, you know, like I said, he's got, he's got tons, of, tons of advice. We've got a question from Jeremy Demers. 
Uh, if you were dropped into a major metropolitan city where you knew nobody and all you had was a cell phone, what steps do you take to get a deal as quickly as possible? You know, that's changed over time. I would say historically, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just ignore the crowd. Okay. 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 Peanut gallery. The, the peanut gallery has gone past their time frame, <clears throat> and they can no longer be quiet. So, yeah, my first uh, my first call at this point, what we teach people to do is just start with cold calling. Like historic, that's new though, right? It's kind of funny. Cold calling isn't new. Like right. I remember being a kid and the sighting guys calling us at dinner time to like from right. Sears or whatever, right, to do stuff. Did I just totally age myself there? You did. And, yeah. Okay. It's okay. Well. Anyway, but, but it's new for real estate investors the past couple of years. It's really kind of picked up steam, right? Right. And so I think with people that are getting started with a low budget and you don't have a lot of resources, that's a great way to get started. Yeah, I agree. Cold calling is definitely one of the best ways. Um, an, another way um, that I think is the easiest way to get deals nowadays, if, if you just want to go get a deal, and I would assume this, you could not do this if you wanted to wholesale, but if you wanted to flip or get a rental, is go to a networking meeting. Right. I mean, you know, nowadays we, especially here in DFW, we have the Propelio meetup, yep. um, which Flip Nerd's going to yeah, be a sponsor. Yeah, we're starting to sponsor next month. Right. Um, you know, there's always several hundred people there. I don't know the exact number. I don't even think Propelio knows the exact number. I think sometimes it's four or five, six hundred people. Um, now but, that we're joining, it'll probably be <laughs> higher. I'm guessing. But every time we we go, I mean, there's an opportunity for us to buy a deal yeah, or partner yeah. with somebody. And, and part of that is utilizing social media though and, sure. and letting people know what it is you do. You know, going back to that Jason McDougall story, goes in a bank, tells somebody what they do, next thing you know, they're a private money lender. Yep. You know, no doubt. you have to let people know what it is you're doing. And nowadays a cell phone might as well be a laptop. I mean, yeah. I, could, I could do everything from a cell phone. So For sure. if there was like on Survivor, you get like one thing, you know, if, <laughs> if that was the one thing that it's gonna be my cell phone. So uh, I think cold calling is definitely the easiest form of marketing to get started with. I agree with that. And then also just getting out there and, uh, and networking. Um, real quick, we're pretty close to, uh, we're, we're at 54 viewers. If everybody can share and invite people, if we can get up to 70 viewers, because last week I think we had like our high was like 65. If we can get to 70 viewers, I will give away a couple of Beat Kids Cancer hats, okay? So, so share, invite your friends. Uh, I know we want to get a couple more questions in and here. And then I'll get bragging rights that I beat Jamie. Yes. I yes, just we, had lunch with Jamie yesterday. So yes, yeah. we need to beat Jamie from last week. <laughs> I have no week. interest in beating Jamie, but. I do, I do, because <laughs> okay. now Jamie is technically my competition with the Iron Hill show on Thursday, uh, 11 a.m. This week we've got Jamie Woolley, uh, my partner Cassie DeHaas, Elizabeth Navarrete, and Bettina Hernandez. Yeah. And uh, they're gonna talk about all kinds of things real estate investing related. It's gonna be great content this week. And so we very much look forward to this week's episode. Uh, and also tomorrow at 11 a.m. we've got Grant Teach Me Something, which uh, I love Grant. I mean, guy is, uh, is amazing at this. So um, how close are we getting? Is anybody, we, we gotta get a lot closer than that, guys. We're only at 56. <laughs> so so if, if, if you were only giving away the beard oil, they I, come flowing I, in. That's fine. I will give away beard oil and the Beat Kids Cancer hat. There you go. And for everybody that doesn't have a beard, it's a great Christmas gift. I said this last <laughs> week. People were like commenting on there like, who wants beard oil? Dude, so we're going to blow up Beat Kids Cancer next year. Are we? You ready? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Yeah. So next year, you <clears> know, <throat> ne subtle plug, we're going to have the, uh, the Titanium Golf Classic that all the proceeds benefit Beat Kids Cancer. We're gonna have it backed up to the Investor Fuel uh, Mastermind. And uh, we're also thinking about having a concert afterwards. A concert? Yeah, so a golf tournament do I need followed to, up. I just told you guys I had an Axl Rose costume that I need to. I, I don't think we're gonna do all that. <laughs> you don't wanna hear me uh, saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, do we have any more questions for Mike before we jump off of here? I've got a question for you. When yeah. are the Dallas Stars going to actually be a good hockey team. I was hopeful after two games. I know, season, right? I was like, oh, we're going to be in the playoffs. And then things just started to fall apart. Yeah. So. so Mike is a Dallas Stars season ticket holder. I'm a, I'm a massive Dallas Stars fan. Subtle hint, uh, my, my birthday was last Friday. 
and uh, you can mail any Dallas Stars gear to <laughs> 777 Main Street, Suite 604, Texas, 76102 wow. for my birthday. Wow, that is awesome, man. And, uh, Gary, uh, I want to get you a Beat Kids Cancer hat. Um, you know, we're, we're very passionate about um, childhood cancer. Um, this all started back when my niece was diagnosed with childhood cancer. She, um, she beat leukemia a couple of years ago, and so I can't be more excited for you and, uh, and for your son beating cancer. So, Gary, definitely send us a private message afterwards so we can get you a Beat Kids Cancer hat and uh, a shirt so we can send that out to you. That's awesome. Question for your, um, Sydney wants to know if you're married, she thinks you're hot. Someone just asked me if I'm married, we're, we're not gonna talk about my personal life here on, <laughs> on Propelio TV. Um, Sydney, Sydney? <laughs> that's, well, live TV has been fun today. We had technical difficulties afterwards. We have, uh, we were missing our, uh, our, our director, Ryan Harper. Cassie did pretty decent today, and uh, but overall, the best part about today was Mr. Mike Hambright. Mike, thank you so much yeah, for coming out. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, out. buddy. Yeah, man. And uh, there you go. What's your primary form of marketing right now? We do everything. I will tell you this. I, I was thinking about. That. I was talking to somebody earlier. They said, well, "What's somebody posted this on Facebook? What's working best right now?" <clears throat> Here's what I'll say: Nothing works well. <laughs> There's nothing that works well. Right. You start to realize in this business, you just have to do a whole bunch of stuff consistently, and then things start to happen. So, right. you know, there's a lot of pressure on direct mail right now, and I think uh, guys like Larry Higgins and some of the people that are teaching cold calling, Greg Helbeck, some of the guys that are in our group, um, that are teaching strategies like that, that you can be more proactive. And I think that's one of the problems that a lot of real estate investors have is. It's easy. It's not easy to write a check, but it's easy to shoot money somewhere and then just kind of sit and wait for things to happen. Right. And I think that that worked for me for a long time. And um, but that's just not working right now. It's too competitive. So I think you got to do a lot of little things depending well, you, on your budget. You and I have interviewed so many people from across the country. Yeah. And we always ask them about their form of marketing, right? Yep. And the two things that I've seen is they either pick one very specific form of marketing and they just dump their entire marketing budget into that one form and essentially become an expert in that form. Sure. And then eventually start selling the services in that <laughs> form of marketing. Or you take the, the school of Jamie Woolley, which is I am going to learn every form of marketing and I'm going to put tons of money into every form of marketing and nobody's going to beat me in any form of marketing in my market because I'm going to be the big dog in it. Yep. And, and that's what she's done. And she couldn't do that from the beginning. She started with direct mail, and then it went to pay-per-click, and then it went to SEO, and then it went to cold calling. And now, you know, two and a half years later, she's just doing all of it. Sure. Pretty much better than all of well, us. Well, she'll even tell you that she's always looking for ways to get more efficient with direct yep. mail, finding a list that everybody doesn't know about. Absolutely. Like you're constantly trying to pivot and find ways to, you know, get little little nuggets that other people don't have. Absolutely. Yep. All right, buddy. Well, thank you for joining us Absolutely. today. I, I think we, we dropped some, uh, some good content out there for <laughs> everybody. And uh, everybody, please check out Propelio.com. Uh, one of the things that Propelio doesn't do often enough on these shows is actually talk about the amazing service that they have and since i'm a loose cannon and i can say whatever i want on their show uh you definitely need to check out their service mls comps lead lists uh, crm websites all kinds of different things uh, for a very very low price i think it's less than a hundred dollars a month so go to propelio.com and without propelio none of this happens today and so thank you to them and uh, tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. for Grant Teach Me Something, and we'll see you all next week.